This is State, State Street. Street. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Is there anybody in here in the building this morning that acknowledges and understands that this is a day that the Lord has made? You're, you're right here right now in this sanctuary because this is a day that the Lord has made. You are in your right mind right now because this is a day that the Lord has made. You have food on your table because this is a day that the Lord has made. You have a roof over your heads because this is a day that the Lord has made. Is there anybody in the building this morning? You have your health and strength because this is a day that the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hey, let us rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. It's to show gratitude. It's to show thanks. It's to say, God be the glory. It's the fact that a matter that no matter what's going on in your life, that you can say hallelujah anyhow. Is there anybody in the building that can just look back over their lives, that look back at what they're going through right now and say hallelujah anyhow. Regardless of what the situation looked like, Regardless of the diagnosis, regardless of the prognosis, regardless of the relationship situation, you can say hallelujah anyhow. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. God's been too good to us. He's been too good to us for us just to sit here and act like that he hasn't done anything for us. We are here right now because of what he has done. It is he who has made us and we have not made ourselves. And I just want to thank him so much personally for myself that one Friday on a hill called Calvary, I couldn't save myself that I was still sinning. But the Bible says that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. Therefore, there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Hey, you can stop walking around being shameful. You can stop walking around guilt tripping yourself because there is no condemnation because of what Jesus has done for you. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Lord, we come this morning saying thank you, Lord. Just want to thank you, Father, for what you have done for us, Lord. You did something that we couldn't do for ourselves, Lord. We just couldn't get it right, Lord. And you just keep giving us chance after chance after chance, Lord. That's that grace and that mercy, Lord. And, Lord, we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for every day, every morning. It's brand new mercies. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord. Yeah, Lord, we love you so much and we praise you, Lord for just sitting high and looking low, Lord, as watching over your children, Lord, us who make mistakes, Lord, but you forgive us. You said that you will throw our sins as far as from the east to the west, Lord. You will throw them in the sea of forgiveness to remember them no more, Lord. And we thank you for that, Lord. I want to thank you for the worshipers that's in the building right now, Lord, that's come to praise and glorify your name. And those that are watching online, Lord, as well, Lord, that they're praising and glorifying their, your name, Lord, because that's what it's really all about. You said in your word, Lord, you said, if I be lifted up, I would draw all men unto myself, Lord. So, Lord, today we're coming to glorify your name, to lift you up, Lord, to speak to us, but to speak through us, Lord, that when somebody see us, when somebody see the church, Lord, they will see Jesus, Lord. And if our hearts are not right, Lord, if our minds are uneasy, Lord, we're asking for your Holy Spirit to come down and rest upon us right now. It's to give us a heart transplant, Lord, to renew our minds, Lord, to get us on the right road and the right page in which we're supposed to be, Lord. And Lord, if we don't get it right, Lord, if we don't know what to say, Lord, the Holy Spirit make intercessions on our behalf, Lord. So, Lord, we just want to say thank you. And we understand, Lord, we can't say thank you enough, Lord, that if we had 10,000 tongues, it still wouldn't be enough, Lord. But we love you and we praise you, Lord. 
We're just ushering in your Holy Spirit today, Lord, to have his way, Lord, to move, Lord, that has never been moved before, Lord, to touch somebody right now, to convict somebody, to provide comfort to somebody, to care somebody, to provide care, Lord. We love and we praise you, Lord. It is in the matchless name of Jesus. No other name uh, but the name of Jesus. It's a name that uh, all will bow to, Lord. It's the name of Jesus that hung, bled, and died one Friday for my sin-sick soul, Lord. That they put him in a grave and they thought it was over with, but early that Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hands, Lord. That that's the name Jesus, not Buddha, not Muhammad, not Sister Teresa, not Gandhi, Lord, but the name of Jesus, Lord, that saves, that provides salvation is in the name of Jesus, Lord. That we pray, Lord, that we send this prayer unto you, Lord, that it may be a sweet aroma unto your nostril, Lord. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And let the church say amen, 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 amen. and amen. Thirty-four through thirty-six, 
And when he had called his people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall have it. For what shall it profit a man if he, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in the adulterous and sinful generations, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Thank you and may God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Let us go to God in prayer. Please clear your minds and think of nothing but our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the one that we are here to glorify and lift up his name. And we want, we want to thank him for allowing us this opportunity. Father God, we come to you thanking you, asking you to forgive us for our sins and shortcomings. Thanking you for sending your son, Jesus, in this world to save us, Lord. Father, we just want to give you all the praise and the glory. We lift you up. We ask, Lord, that you never leave us. Always stay with us, Lord. For, well, Lord, we need you. We need you now more than we've ever needed you, Lord. This world is in turmoil. And we know, Lord, that only you is the answer to this problem that we have here. We ask you to bless all of the people that are in the sanctuary here, all of those who is in the, on the television looking at us virtually. Bless them, Lord. Let them know that you still exist and you're not dead. You're very much alive. Jesus is sitting on the right-hand side of the Father, interceding for us. And for that, Lord, we thank you. You've paid so much for us, Lord. You gave your life up on Calvary's cross so that we all may have an opportunity to the tree of life. And we want to thank you for that, Lord. There's so many things we need to thank you for, Lord, and we can't even mention them in the time that we have here. But we want to give you the praise and glory while we can. Father, bless this city. Bless all the, our officials. Bless the government, Lord, the, or the state. Bless the ones of this country, Lord, for truly they need it. Father, bless our president. Help him to continue the good work that he's doing. Help us, Lord, forgive those sinners who cause us so much misery and pain. Help us, Lord, to forgive our enemy the way that you want us to forgive them. Help us to be strengthened by all the things that they do to us that cause us to stay on our knees praying to you, asking for forgiveness, Lord. Please, Lord, bring the foolishness out of our church. It seems like some of the Christians here that think everything is funny. You then think it's to be laughed at in some manner. But when their brothers and sisters are trying to do something decent and in order, the communication seems to be broken down. They don't want to listen to the problems and help, being, uh, help them being solved by the suggestions and things. They want to do things their way, and that way is a, a one way, and it's not of God. It's not spiritual. We ask, Lord, that you continue to stay with us, Lord. Teach us your holy word, Lord. Your word is the only thing that we can live by, that we know that we will be right in and walk a righteous life. Father, we just thank you. We just want to thank you for all the blessings you've given us. Thank you for food, clothing, shelter. Thank you for our families, Lord. Help us to be better Christians, Lord. For truly we know that you desire us to be. Forgive us, Lord, when we fail. Help us to be stronger in your word and live according to your word. And Father, we give you all the praise and the glory. 
all the things that you do for us. We just want to thank Jesus for dying on Calvary's cross for all of us. Lord, continue to stay with us and guide us. We pray this prayer in your son, Jesus' holy name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I need you to do me a favor today. Would you do that for me? Lean to your neighbor and say, today, today. God's going to get the glory out of this. Now give him a clap, hand clap of praise. Now you can sit there all you want to, but we're going to give God the glory up here, okay? Here we go. You just give him glory. Give him glory. That's all I can do is give him glory. Just give him glory, give him glory, yeah, I'm going to give him glory, well, give him glory, yeah, give him glory, oh yeah, glory, oh God's gone, Good morning. Oh, come on now. Good morning. We didn't have to be here. 
And like we just said, God, God's get to get the glory. So I can't make you get the glory. I can get my own glory. But hopefully you got something today. If we have any visitors with us today, um, would you please stand? Give us your name and any words you'd like to share. So it's so good to see see you. Thank you for visiting with us this morning. And you know what? You're one of us now. So anytime you're around this area, please feel like you can come in these doors and, and worship ever how you see fit because you're one of us. And come again. These are our announcements for the week. Um, save the date, September 10th, 2022, 9 a.m. Um, Teen Jesus. It's being sponsored by the BWMC Missionary Conference, and there's a registration fee that will be accepted until July 30th, and this will be put on um, the bo board somewhere so you can see. It says, in it to win it with Team Jesus, be steadfast, unmovable, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Keynote speaker will be Pastor Sean Silver. On Saturday, August 20th, at 12 noon, just two blocks down the street, um, George, George Washington Carver Center will be having Remembering Our Community Day, and there will be speakers and, and refreshments and just good fun, good collaboration, good speaking and seeing and talking with each other. Amen? And then uh, two more things. One, I'd just like to, if Pastor Kay would give me permission, I have somebody special who has a birthday today, and I always forget it, and she's one of my besties from, from college, and she's always been there through the thick and thin, so, um, and she's an associate mem member here at the church. So I just want to say happy birthday, Jamita. Um, I remembered it this time. And then secondly, people, and I just want to give this testimony, and I guess it has to go with that song we just sung. This morning I decided I wanted some Starbucks, and I had actually gotten up early, and gotten dressed before I went to pick up Miss Barbara and Mr. Dewey, and I said, I'm gonna get me some Starbucks. So I went in there and I asked for what I wanted, and the lady said, I'm sorry, we don't have strawberries, but we have this other thing if you'd like to try it. And I just looked at her and I said, you know, I'm kind of disappointed, but I'll try it. And I could have been nasty and walked out and not gotten it, but I just said, I'll try it. And she said, you know what? It's on me today. I know that was just a Starbucks, but I could have been nasty and not had anything, but she blessed me. So when, she, when, when I got my order, I had to say to her, I felt like I needed to say to her, thank you and be blessed. Because she didn't have to do, she didn't have to do that. So I guess what I'm saying is, if you're nice to people, even if you don't like what they say, but if you're nice to people, you might get a blessing in return, and I really appreciate, I know it was just a Starbucks, Pastor K, but you know what? I could, keep, I could keep my gift card in my pocket and use it for another day. So just, just be a blessing in some way, and if somebody does something nice to you, please say thank you. Please say thank you. So this is from our pastor's corner. We bring, good, we bring God glory. Hmm, give him glory. This wasn't planned, right? We bring God glory by loving other believers. When you are born again, you become a part of God's family. Following Christ is not just a matter of believing. It, is also, it also includes belonging and learning to love the family of God. John wrote, our love for each other proves we have gone from death to life. Paul said, Accept each other just as Christ has accepted you, then God will be glorified. It is our responsibility to learn how to love as God does. Let me say that again. It is our responsibility to learn how to love as God does because God is love and it honors him. Jesus said, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. 
By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So in one way or another, let's love one another. And y'all have a blessed week. Two things. Number one, yesterday we had our leadership meeting. And all of those who wanted to be leaders have to attend these meetings. The next meeting is on the 27th, which is a Saturday. It starts at 10 a.m. and ends roughly around 12, 1, 2, something like that. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we start at 12 for sure. I mean, start at 10 for sure. So if you're one interested in being a leader, <laughs> Come on to the leadership meeting on Saturday, uh, the 27th. And one more thing, and I'm going to let you go. Does anybody know what today is? Installation, Installation service. We officially make Reverend Warren our pastor. Amen, 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 amen. So please, please, sisters and brothers, let's come back and support him this afternoon at 3 o'clock. Um, uh, there will be a lot of folk from Nashville coming in. So we want to be here maybe 2.30 so that we can welcome them in and welcome to State Street and show them that old State Street hospitality, okay? This afternoon at 3 o'clock. Thank you very much. Y'all have a good day. Is there anybody that's glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Is there anybody just going to give God the glory right now? for all of the great things that he has done. Amen. Just want to send a little reminder out there to you all that uh, uh, in-person Bible study has resumed at 12 noon and 6 p.m. And 10 a.m. on Thursdays is our virtual Bible study as well. We'd love to see your face in the place. Amen, amen, amen. Um, those that will be in leadership positions next year, those who um, know that you want to be a leader, uh, in the month of September, we will be taking our official headshots here at the church. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It's part of the vision that the Lord has given me going into 2023. Amen. That we will be taking your official headshots. So anybody that's in a leadership position, chairperson, president, um, that you will be a, have a headshot. Amen. Uh, remember that tithe and offering is a part of worship. Amen. That is a part of worship. It belongs to God and he has given you just a little bit to be responsible for. Amen. So uh, we have a square machine outside for those who don't carry cash or don't write checks anymore. We have a square machine right outside in which you can do what we call restricted funding, which means that if you want your money to go to a certain ministry, you have that ability to do that with the square machine. Amen. You can also write it on your envelope as well. But uh, we just remind us that it is a part of worship. Those that are on social media, always remember, always remember to like, share the page with others. You just never know that somebody may be out there in need of a message and a word and that you could be that example. Amen. They can see it from you. I want to thank all of our visitors that are online, that are watching online right now, and those that are in the building. My good friend Chris Wheeler is here with me this morning. Let me tell you all something about Chris Wheeler. That is is a living testimony. Amen. He is a living testimony. God has been so good to him that he is my cycling partner as well. And he leaves me every time. <laughs> Amen. This man can ride a bike like it's no other. I need some training wheels to keep up with him now. Amen. We went on a, uh, we, we, the first time we rode together, I thought, you know, I was used to a little seven, eight miles and I had hit my maximal point and we're just riding and Chris keeps going. And I'm like, okay, any minute now, he's gonna turn around and come back. <laughs> he keeps riding, keep pedaling, and keep pedaling, and keep pedaling. Uh, and I'm very competitive, so I wasn't gonna let him get to me, but we just, we ended up all the way downtown Nashville and we started away in Antioch at the dam. <laughs> and then you gotta realize you gotta get back. 
I was like, man, will he stop? God, he's not tired yet. God, but nonetheless, there's my good friend Chris. He's from Stateland Baptist Church, uh, which is my home church, and I love him dearly. Amen, amen. Has there anybody ever found yourself in a position that no matter what you did, you can't find your way out of it? You can't call anybody, you can't pay for anything, you can't pay for no favors, you can't, you have, have you ever found yourself in that situation? Well, when you get out of the situation, you can thank nobody but God. Well, if you're not in that position or if you're in that place in this space, then there is a word from Jeremiah today in which we find Israel in a peculiar position, but the Lord will intervene. After the next selection for the choir, I want you to meet me at Jeremiah, the 24th chapter. I'm going to lift up in your hearing verses number six and number seven. Jesus 
There's something that the old church would say right about now. One of the old mothers of the church would say it was nobody but Jesus. And if you don't understand what everybody is praising and shouting about right now, then they had another saying where they said, baby, just keep on living. It was nobody but Jesus. You, 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 you done some things yourself out here in the world. And the only way that you're alive right now, the only way that you got breath in your body right now, the only way that you got a reasonable portion of your health and strength because it was nobody, nobody, nobody. No, but when you move out of the situation and out of the equation with everybody else, it was nobody but Jesus. I'm reminded of a story. I got to get in this text. I got to get in this text, but I'm reminded of a story with a man named Hezekiah. Hezekiah had received word that he was about to die. And, and he was king, and the Bible says that he, he had 
princes and uh, wise men all around him. He had counselors all around him, but he turned his face to the wall and talked to the Lord. And before the prophet was able to get out of the city, the Lord told the prophet to go back and tell him that he should live. Somebody said it like this, just a little talk with Jesus. We'll make everything all right. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta get in this text. Y'all, y'all, y'all leave me alone this morning. Y'all leave me alone. I gotta get in this text this morning, this morning, this morning. That there is a word from the Lord this morning. Oh yes, it's some, it's just something about the spirit that that will confirm and reveal some things because I I guarantee you none of this, none of the songs, none of the shouting, none of this was planned today. But 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 this text was already done by Thursday. But it's just the Lord confirming. Ah uh, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. So if if you start shouting over the scripture, I'll understand. <laughs> Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Jeremiah, the 24th chapter. Lift up two little verses in your hearing. If you're physically able to stand, I ask that you please stand for the reading of God's word. Jeremiah, the 24th chapter, verses number six and seven. And on the screen is the New International Version, but I'll be reading the King James Version. And it says, for I will set my eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up, and I will give them an heart to know me that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. So you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Uh, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. Today I want to preach using as a title, God will see you through. God will see you through. Let us pray. Lord, we come today to say thank you, Lord. Just want to thank you for being God and God all by yourself. A God who sits high and looks low, Lord. Lord, I'm asking this morning that you speak to me, but you speak through me, Lord. Hide me so they can see thee, Lord. Lord, we're just asking that your word today convict, Lord, but provide care and compassion. But at the meantime, Lord, please, Father, give me the physical strength and the spiritual energy to preach your word today with humbleness, with humility, with power, with strength, Lord, so that somebody out there that don't know you, Lord, can come running and asking, what must I do to be saved? Lord, and those that already know you just really want to reaffirm them and confirm them, Lord, that you love them, Lord, and you have their best interests at hand, Lord. And if anyone has slid off the pathway, went down the path of destruction, Lord, have turn their back, that they will turn back unto you, Lord. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And the church all together say, Amen. Amen. God will see you through. If you don't believe it or not, then it is my job as preacher pastor to inform you that God has a plan in everything that he does through and in us. He has purposes and they are good. Everything, Deacon Jackson, that we go through in this life as we follow Christ, though sometimes they're painful, should be considered good because it happens according to his purposes and all of his purposes are good. But, but sometimes, though, there is a 
question that we have to ask ourselves, that as we wrestle with this thing called faith, that how do you make it through the hard times? You, you lost a spouse, how do you make it? You're dealing with an illness, how do God help you make it? No matter what storm you face, I come to let you know that God will see you through. God will see you through because he is faithful. As we look at the text this morning, we're meeting one of our famous prophets, also as a priest named Jeremiah. And you know Jeremiah is the one who was called and as a child and had no idea what he was supposed to be doing. Had some doubts about his calling and didn't think that he could measure up to what God has for him. And the Lord tells him that I knew you before I formed you. I had a purpose for you before you even was born. And I want to let you know that God has a purpose for your life even before you was born. That he has something special for you to do. Do not measure yourself and your success by other people. But it's to understand what God has for your life. Although some life lessons are painful, they're for your good. But this is a situation this morning that Judah is dealing with. In this 24th chapter or even in the book of Jeremiah, we find out that this is a great time of mourning and despair for the people of Judah. I mean, they're crying. They're devastated. It is a hard time because Nebuchadnezzar had conquered Jerusalem and carried away the king. He's carried away all the nobles. He carried away all the skilled laborers and all the men of valor captive into Babylon. This, this is where we get Daniel and the three Hebrew boys. They've been captured and they've been taken from their homeland and they've been sent to Babylon as captives. And there is a remnant was left of poor people to work the land under the rule of another king. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah prophesied like this. He says he sees two baskets of figs. One fig was no good and the other one was good. And he had an understanding. He had a question. He was trying to understand, Lord, what do you mean? And the Lord says, the bad figs are the one that I'm going to leave here and the good ones are the one that's in captivity. Oh my God, you just blew my mind, Lord. You mean to tell me the ones who've been captive are the good ones? And the ones that you're going to leave here are the bad ones? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And as you know, in my famous style that I like to do, let me give you the background to understand today's breakdown. Because Joshua is off the scene. And y'all know the story that Moses had freed the Israelites from the Egyptian rule cross the Red Sea on dry land. Manna comes every day, snake bites. They decide to make a golden calf. He talks to the rock. The rock spits out water. He hits the rock. The rock spits out water. He disobeys God. He can't go into the promised land. Miriam and Joshua, Miriam and Aaron, they talk about Moses and what he did. They're formed with leprosy. They can't go into the promised land. They send them over to the promised land to spy out the land. They come back and they have self-doubt and self-pity. They don't realize that God can do certain things in their life. They come back and there's 12 of them and 10 of them said we can't do it and Joshua and Caleb said we can do it. And for that, they turn around and for 40 years they're marching around the mountain but let me let you know something that you can march around the mountain but God is still in your presence. 
Moses is now gone. Joshua goes ahead and tells them to circumcise yourself, rededicate yourself unto the Lord. They get ready to cross the Jordan River. He goes ahead and the destruction from the Lord. The Lord said, won't you take the Ark of the Covenant before you? Why? Because you've never been this way before. And if we just allow God's presence to go before us because we haven't been that way before, God will always make things work out for us. Yeah. They get over to the other side. They start conquering the land. They start inhabiting the promised land. And God is letting everything fall in place. Joshua is getting ready to go off the scene, and he's telling them like this. He says, be courageous. He says, for me and my house, we're going to praise. I don't care what you do, but as for me and my house, we're going to praise the Lord. He says, be courageous, be of good cheer, because the Lord is with you. He guides you. He's there for you. He will not forsake you. He's always there with you. But what do we know just a generation later? The children of Israel start to do things their own way. The Bible says that they start to do things in their own eyes. And then they allow some of the occupants in the promised land to stay there and didn't drive them out like they were supposed to. And the Lord said, because you did this, they're going to always be a thorn in your side. And they didn't listen to the Lord and they had idol worships and then all of a sudden they'll get captured and they will come calling to God and God will raise up a judge. He'll raise up a judge, the people will repent, they'll go back to worshiping God, and then as everything seems okay, they'll turn back and go back to their wicked ways. The Lord will lift up another judge, they'll cry out to the Lord, save us, help us. The Lord will lift up another judge, they'll repent, come back to the Lord, and then go back to their wicked ways. They'll get captured again, they'll go cry. Does that sound like somebody that you know right now, that they will just keep on doing things over and over and over again? But the Lord got this thing called grace and mercy. Where he's just going to go ahead and bring up another judge into their life to free them, to save them from their occupants. And then they turn back to their wicked ways. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, they start looking around and saying, everybody else got a king, then why do we not have a king? They start asking and begging for a king because they want something they can touch, they can feel, they can lay their eyes upon. And Samuel gets upset. Samuel gets mad. Samuel doesn't understand that why in the world do you want a king? And the Lord tells Samuel, it's not you that they turn their back on, it's me. Yes, sir. For I am their king, but they have turned their back on it. But let me go ahead and appoint Saul. And the Bible said during his inauguration, Saul was hiding. Because they decided to pick a man that looked good and didn't have the courage to do good. You got to be careful when you're picking off of looks. You got to have somebody in your life that has courage to do the right thing. Don't honor the looks can always because beauty is only skin deep. Somebody, I got a temptation fan in here this morning. That beauty is only skin deep. She may be lovely on the outside, but hood on the inside. Yeah, they, 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 they end up getting Saul, and Saul does this, Saul does that. He leads the people astray. He didn't listen to the Lord. The Lord tears the mantle from him, says, I'm going to give it to somebody else. He goes, finds a little shepherd boy by the name of David. David out in the field. David comes in. He kills Goliath. The people start celebrating him and start loving him. Saul gets mad, gets angry at him, starts chasing him, and David is doing everything that he can not to turn and not to kill this man he says that touch not my anointed Saul is off the scene now David is the king David is doing great thing the greatest 40 years in Israel's history he recaptures city he's captured doing everything that he's supposed to do bring the ark of the covenant back into the temple David is now off the scene there's Solomon Solomon is now the king and Solomon in all his splendid glory does everything he's supposed to do until the end of his life Start having concubines, start doing everything that was wrong. And when Solomon's off the scene, then all of a sudden there is nobody else to lead the people. You got a general and you got a son. And they're looking at each other and they're saying that what shall we do? And you got a son that says that my father taxed the people. 
to rebuild the temple. Therefore, I'm going to tax them even heavier. I'm going to do something to them even harder than what my father had done. And the elders told him, don't do it. And he does it anyway. So now we got a split nation now. We got a divided nation now. That we got 10 tribes to the north that keeps the name of Israel. And you got two tribes by the name of Judah and Benjamin at the bottom in which Benjamin uh, goes and encapsulates themselves into Judah, in which we call Judah. It's the southern region now. You got two nations. And the Bible repeatedly tells us that there was one king after another. They did worse than the previous king. They're doing idol worship now. They're not keeping true to the one true God. And the Assyrians come in and they take over the ten tribes to the north. And this is very peculiar because we see this when Jesus speaks to the Samaritan woman at the well. Because they come in and they populate with the current people that's in the nation at the time. So what they end up doing is calling the people to the ten tribes to the north as half-breeds. So that's why when Judah, where Jesus has come, would not associate with people from the ten tribes to the north. Because they see them as half-breeds. They don't see them as true Israelites anymore. So they will walk all the way around the city in order not to come in contact with them. The Syrians come in, take over ten tribes to the north, but it's no different than the two tribes at the bottom, to the east, I mean to the south. They do what they want to do. They have idol worship. They're just doing anything that they want to do. And the Lord has sent a prophet, Samuel. He sent, he's just sending prophets after prophets to let them know Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Micah, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Elijah, and Elisha. He's sending all the prophets to come through and let them know that get your stuff together. And they wouldn't do it. Finally. Finally, <laughs> the Lord calls Nebuchadnezzar to go down and take over the city. He goes and takes over Judah and he starts to ship them back, ship them back to Babylon. And the people are confused. The people are hurt. The people are painting it. They even ask the question, is there no bomb in Gilead? Because they need some medicine, they need some help, they need some savior to help them get out of this situation. They don't understand it. And Jeremiah, he, he's not being accepted by the people and he says, you know what, I'm tired of you people and I'm going to just stop preaching. But something inside of him couldn't let him stop preaching. He said, it's like fire, shut up in my bones. They put him in prison because he wouldn't say what the people wanted him to say. The king wanted him to tell the people that everything was going to be okay. And Jeremiah said, I can't do that. He says, no, no, no. So Nebuchadnezzar comes in, takes the people, and he sends them on to Babylon. And, 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 and this is when Jeremiah sees the vision of the basket of figs. He said the good figs represent the captives and the bad figs represents the remnant that was left behind. And life looked hopeless for those that are captive because they're being captive. They're being sent from their homeland and they're being sent to another land. And you would think that something isn't right here because why can't we stay? What shouldn't the good figs represent those that are staying here? But all hope is not lost. All hope is not lost because it's God that allowed their captivity. And even though God allowed their captivity, they were not forsaken. And I just want to just see if there's anybody in the building that has found themselves in some situations at times that don't feel good. And God is not, and sometimes he's punishing you, sometimes trying to get you on the right road. And it seems like God has abandoned you, but then I let you know that he has not forsaken you. Sometimes God allows things to get you back on the right road in which you're supposed to be in the first place. Judah's corruption was a result of individual choices. The people chose to abandon God. And although the frustrations of life, just as Judah was a result from their own mistakes, however, there are some promises for those who abide in the Lord. God has made some promises 
to those who seek him. That's why he said those that are in captivity are the good things because I'm going to allow them to continue to worship me. If you continue to worship me, although you're going through the frustrations of life, I will see you through. Uh, this, this is the first point that I want to raise. We've got to understand that God will respond. Through the frustrations in your life, God will respond. Because in verse number six, he says, I will set my eyes upon them for good. This is God speaking. He says, I will set my eyes upon them for good. Although I've got them in captivity, although I am punishing them for something that they did wrong, I have set my eyes upon them. The people were already in captivity. They had been taken away from their homeland, uprooted and carried off. Their life of self-indulgence and neglect of the Lord had ended in their captivity. But the Lord says, I got my eyes on you. They, they, they felt that all hope was lost. Their rebellion had resulted in total rejection from the Lord. They found themselves in a distant place. And sometimes we will find ourselves in distant places. But the Lord said, I have my eyes on you. I, 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 I see you. No, don't worry about it. I, I, I see you. Because we see this in Psalms 137 as, as they're being carried off. Their tormentors start to torment them even more. And they said, where are all these happy songs you used to sing? Where are all this joy you used to have? And they respond, they say, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? That their enemies had carried them from their own homeland and to complete their woes, they insulted them and required of them to sing these happy songs, but they couldn't sing a happy song because they wasn't home. And sometimes we're in a captive situation and we can't find a song to sing. And even though you can't find a song to sing, just know the Lord have his eyes on you. Uh, as they faced the reality of what their sin had caused, they felt abandoned by God. But God is merciful. He is a God of mercy, even in chastisement. Even if you feel like he's not there, even though he's doing something to you that you don't agree with, it's something that you had did wrong, and he is chastising you because the Bible said those whom he loved, he chastises. Uh, he has not forsaken his people. He says, I got my eyes on you. I see you. I hear your prayers. I'm watching over you. God is always aware of where you are. No, no matter what you're going through in this life, no matter what you go through in this world, God is always aware of where you are and what you need. Even though you can't even sing a song of Zion, he got his eyes on you. Your prayers are not in vain. Your complaints will not go unanswered. That's why the songwriter says that, oh, why should I be discouraged? Why should I fear? His eye is on the sparrow. Therefore, I know he watches over me. He says that his eye is on the sparrow, the smallest bird there is. And if God has his eye on the sparrow, then I know he watches over me. Uh, but not only, not only, not only, not only will God said he will respond. He said, I'll do two more things. He said, I've heard your prayers, and I'm going to answer them. But this is how I'm going to answer your prayer. I'm going to restore and repair. Hold on. You, you, you got us in captivity. You're, 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 you're paying us the wages for what we have done, Lord. And you're saying that you're going to hear us and you're going to restore us and repair us. He said it like this. He said, I will bring them again to this land. 
He says, he's Jeremiah, tell them that although they have left their homeland, I am going to bring them back. Yes. Now that all, <laughs> uh, during the times when God takes something away from you, it, it's, it's, it's easy to feel duped. Because the Lord's generosity can be misunderstood as cruelty. See, see, many of them probably wondered if they'll ever see home ever again. I mean, as they're being captive, if they're being sent to Babylon, they're wondering, will we ever see this place ever again? Would they get to enjoy the abundance and the beauty of their homeland? They were no longer free to enjoy the benefits of God's blessing. And, and, and what God wants them to really understand is that are you satisfied with the gift or the giver? He, he says, are you happy with the gift or the giver? Because if you are happy just with the gift, then when the gift is taken from you, you'll be down and out. But if you know the one who gave you the gift in the first place, if you know the one who has all the blessings in the first place, that no matter where you are, he can still take care of you. No matter what you're doing, no matter what situation you're in, he still got you because he got his eye over you and he said, I'll restore and repair. Why? Because I will see you through. He said, I will see you through. He says, basically, I'm going to return you. You are going to recover. It's going to be refreshing. I'm going to put you back. Yes, sir. He said, that, that, that's what I am going to do. That's why Joel says in 227, he says that I will restore the years that the swarming locust has eaten. He says, I will build them up and not pull them down. He, he's talking to people that he's punishing at the same time. I, I just never understood. My mama used to whoop me as a child. She used to whoop me, and at the same time, she'll say, I'm doing this because I love you. I couldn't understand why you're punishing me, and then you're talking about you love me at the same time. And that's exactly what God is saying right here, that I'm punishing you right now, but because I love you, I'm going to restore you. Yeah. All is not lost. Yeah. He, 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 he. The people through their eyes, all is gone. Their homes have been destroyed. The temple has been ravaged. Families have been separated. Life as they knew it had completely fallen apart. This proud, blessed people have been reduced to slaves in captivity. And God has promised to rebuild their lives. It's been destroyed. He will once again build this people up and not tear down as the Babylonians had. And I just want to let somebody know that God is not just going to bring you back. He's going to make it better than ever. Now, whatever situation that you're in, whatever problems you're dealing with, whatever situation that you're in, what roadblocks you're facing, that God is going to bring you back and it's going to be better than ever. Whatever has torn you down, I want you to know that God can repair it. Whatever have your mind up at night that you can't sleep, God can repair it. The situation, the health crisis that you're dealing with, God can repair it. The children that you're dealing with right now that seem like they don't want to listen to you, seem like they don't want to come to church, seem like they don't want to be a part of anything, God can repair it. And here it is, God is pledging to restore his repentant people to a place of blessing after judgment. If you've been to Bible study, you understand what that word blessing means. Bekaros, meaning God's divine approval, his stamp of approval. That God says, you're going to have my stamp of approval and I'm going to bring you back to where you once, where you once were. That's why I understand that every time I talk to Sister Buffett, I said, how you doing? She says, I'm blessed. Because she realizes 
that she has God's stamp of approval. And I just want to know, is there anybody in the building that understands that you have God's stamp of approval? that you are blessed beyond measure. It's nothing that we can do to ever receive it, but it's this thing called grace and mercy. Uh, uh, but here's the thing, that having God fix the issue does not mean that all our problems instantly go away. However, it does mean that God gives us the strength we need to walk through the hard times. And he gives us an unimaginable peace that goes beyond our understanding to endure whatever troubles that we face. That's how he repairs. But then he says, not only will I restore and repair when I respond, he says, what I am going to do is I'm going to revive. I'm going to revive. He says, I'm going to restore you. I'm going to bring you back because you're blessed, because you got my stamp of approval. I'm going to repair it. So what you see right now that seems down and out, I'm going to repair it. But then I'm going to give it life. He, he, he says, I'm going to give it life. He says, I will plant them and not pluck them up. See, 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 here, here, there's the sons of Korah in Psalms 85 and 6. They, they said it like this. They said, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? See, that, that, that's a rhetorical question. But they yearn for a positive answer. See, their nation had become spiritually impotent. They had forgotten about God. They didn't care about God. They did everything that they wanted to do. And he says that the joy that we once had, the fellowship with the Lord that we once had is now gone. And they needed to come alive in God. They need to revive. And I like that word revive because for my English majors in here, you will understand that the word revive is a transitive verb. It's an action word. It's a transitive verb. It's characterized by transition. In so many words, it's a process. Yes, sir. It, it, when it first starts, it doesn't look like it does when it ends. Okay, okay, come here, come here, come here. It, it basically means to restore to consciousness of life, to restore from a depressed, inactive, or unused state. To renew in the mind or memory. God is saying that there is something dead in your life, but I am going to give it life. Right now in the very beginning, it looks dead. It looks dim. It looks like it's destructed. It looks like it's demolished. It looks like it's not going to happen, but it's a transitive verb, which meaning that what it's going to look like on the other side is not what it looks like right now. That right now your situation look bleak. It look like God is not working in your life. It look like that everything that you had just a year ago, Sister Kayla Bailey sat there and just looked like that probably nothing is going right. Her husband is sitting there with her day in and day out. But look at her right now that the Lord has revived her. That it's a process that now she's in the choir stand and she's singing. I saw her on Wednesday. She came out to choir's practice and she drove herself. That's how God revives. It don't always start out the way it ends. It's a transitive verb. It's to carry through. It's a resuscitation because something is dead and you start CPR on it. But the end result, it lives. When you started, it was dead. When you finish, it's alive. And that's what God is saying, that right now there are some dead spirits in the house, but I'm going to revive you. State Street may look dead, but we're going to do some CPR, and State Street is going to live. Hey, that, that, that's why I like the song that said, we praise thee, O God, for the son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. 
but they said a refrain like this from our music majors. They said, hallelujah, dying the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, dying the glory. Revive us again. Is there anybody in their life that just want to ask God just to revive me just one more time? Uh, he says, uh, when I respond, when I respond, I'm going to restore you. I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to repair you. I'm going to build you back up. I'm going to give you new life. And after I do that, then I'm going to reward you and remain with you. That's it, I'm done. He says, when I respond, I'm going to restore you. I'm going to bring you back. Okay? When, when, when I bring you back, I'm not going to just bring you back and leave you there. I'm going to repair what was broken in your life. He says, when I get done repairing what's broken in your life, then I'm going to revive. I'm going to give it new life. I'm going to bring it back to life where you get the glory and the honor unto me. That, that, that's what I'm going to do. But then I'm going to reward you and I'm going to remain. I'm going to reward you and I'm going to remain. He says, I will give them a heart to know me. That I am the Lord and I'll be their God. See, see the very thing that resulted in their captivity was a heart that was hard towards God. And they wouldn't recognize God himself. And, and he says, once I respond by restoration, I'll respond by repairing. And once I respond by reviving, I'm going to reward and remain with you. See, once the people were brought again into the land, God was going to give them the very thing that they needed the most. State Street, God is going to give us the very thing that we need the most. Now, 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 here's the fact. Because they had turned their back on them, God would have been just at letting his wrath pour out on them. He had every right to because he's a just God. But rather than being a God of wrath and allowing us to suffer in judgment, he is a God of mercy, willing to touch and soften hearts that are hard and defiant. Yes, he said, that's what I'm going to do. Yes. We are undeserving of any of the mercies of God. Because were it not for the mercies of God, we would all be consumed. Yes, he would have been just to condemn us to hell. He would have been right to have allowed us to suffer the consequences of our sin. Even after we've been saved and we sin. But God always forgives. And he says, I'm going to keep rewarding you every single morning. Somebody connect the dots for me this morning. He says, I'm going to reward you every single morning. Every single morning are brand new mercies. Yeah. Great yeah. is thy faithfulness. Yeah. That every single day that when I mess up the next day, he don't hold it against me. He just gives me a brand new slate yeah. and cleans it up. He says that that's what I'm going to do. Each time we face trials, God is always faithful. He provides enough grace for the day. God will see us through one moment at a time. You'll help me close this, won't you? He says, I'm going to remain. He says, I will be their God. See, Judah faced difficulties because of their sin. And they were responsible for the hardships they endured. And they may have felt that all they had 
was lost forever. But he's saying to them, he said that I was your God before the captivity. And I'll remain your God after the captivity. God had not forsaken them. And he says that I never will. He says that I'm going to remain with you forever and ever. Forever and ever. That once I restore you back to your rightful place. And I just believe that there is somebody in the house today that may feel that God would never respond. You may feel that God may never restore. He may never repair, revive, but God says, I will reward you and I will remain. That you will recover. Can I let you know why you will recover? Because God will see you through. No matter what you go through in this life, that God will see you through. That we all face times of difficulties. And we think that God may have abandoned us. But he is still our God. He is the Almighty. He is the great I am. He is the first and he is the last. He is the true and living God. And we may turn our backs upon him and cause him great disappointment. But he is still our God. And he still loves us. Here's the fact of the matter of it like this. That this is not something that just anybody can do. But this is only from God. He says that although you disappoint me, I will see you through. And once I see you through it, you will return back to your rightful place. And I just want to know, is there anybody in the building this morning just so glad that God saw them through? And no matter what situation you've been in, he saw you through it. Through hard times and difficulties, he saw you through. That I can remind of a story of the Apostle Paul and what he was going through. That he says that we are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but not destroyed. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter, but nothing can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus. Now it makes a whole lot of sense when it says that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and to them that are called according to his purpose. That you got to understand that it was nobody but God. That we couldn't get our way out of it. We couldn't see our way out of it. We couldn't pay our way out of it. But one Friday on a hill called Calvary, they took our Savior and they hung him high. They took our Savior and they stretched him wide. And our Savior died for us. Didn't he die? I'm so glad he died. When well, they took him off of that old rugged cross, they put him in a borrowed tomb where well, he stayed there all night Friday, all day Saturday, but early that Sunday morning. He got up. He got up with all power in his hands. It was only through the Lord. Only through the Lord. We couldn't do it. There's nothing we could do to get our way out of it. And God said he is going to repair it. He hears our prayers. He will respond. Don't you give up on God because he hasn't given up on you. Although you may be going through some difficult times right now, you may be in some difficult situations right now, you can't find your up from your down, your left from your right, but God will see you through. Stay straight. He saw us through it. He saw us through it. He saw us through it. That now today we can celebrate that he saw us through it. 
and he'll continue to see you through it. It will be difficult at times. It will be hard at times. But he will see you through it. The doors of the church are now open. Maybe there's somebody here right now that's having a difficult moment in their life. And they just don't understand what they're going through. And, and it seems hopeless right now. See that there's no help right now. But just because it doesn't feel like it doesn't mean that God is not working it out. Doesn't mean that he doesn't have your best interest at heart. That if you give your life to Jesus right now, he will see you through. No matter the difficulties, no matter the problems. We all make mistakes in life. Judah had made up and get you back right, knowing that in the process, I'm going to restore you. Maybe somebody right now is looking for restoration. He says, I'm going to restore you, and then I'm going to repair you. Maybe there's somebody out there that's looking for a repair right now. Something is broken in your life right now. Your heart is broken. Your relationship is broken. Your values is broken. Your household is broken. But the Lord said that I will repair it. And that's just not all I'm going to do. I'm going to revive it. I'm going to give it new life. I'm going to start all over again. Give you something to live for. I'm going to perform CPR. So many times we try to do it ourselves and God said, let me take over and let me resuscitate you. I, I, got, the, I got the formula to make it work. And then once the life comes back into it, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. So I'm going to send my son Jesus to die for you. And then once he die, he's going to send his Holy Spirit to be with you forever and ever and ever and ever. That's the type of God that we serve. We serve a God who will see us through. Maybe you just need individual prayer now. It's time to come to the altar. You just need individual prayer or you can stay at your seats and we can do collective prayer. But just know that God will see you through. Maybe you're struggling with something right now. You're struggling. You're on the fence right now at giving your life to God. You can come down right now and give your life to the Lord and get under this protection that he has for you. Let's go to the throne of grace. Lord, we come right now to say thank you. Thank you, Father, for watching over us. And sometimes the difficulties in life, they don't feel good. And we wonder and we twiddle our thumbs and we just wonder, Lord, have you abandoned us? And you said, no, I haven't abandoned you. I hear you and I'm going to respond. And I'm going to respond and give you what you need the most. Sometimes, Lord, we understand it's not what we want, but it's what we need. Because if we needed money, you would have sent us a banker. If we needed the big fancy house, you would have sent us an architect. If we needed anything else, Lord, you would have sent that, but we needed a savior. We need a salvation, and you send your son, Jesus. That, Lord, we say thank you, Lord. So we won't get caught up in the materialistic things, Lord. But, Lord, we'll get caught up in giving you the glory and giving you all the honor that you are due, Lord, because you are worthy to be praised, Lord. And once we do that, Father, once we give that over to you, Lord, we'll receive the stamp of approval. We'll have your divine favor, Lord, called blessed. Although the situation looked bleak for Judah, 
They didn't seem like they were blessed, but they really were. Because you was working it out, Lord, although they couldn't see it. And right now, Lord, whatever problem that somebody have right now, Lord, we know that you're working it out, Lord. And you're going to make everything all right. And that person right now that's struggling in their heart that don't know you in the free part of the sin, Lord, please touch them, Lord, with the Holy Spirit and let them know that forgiveness is there. Love is there. Mercy is there. Grace is there, Lord, to accept them, Lord, and to watch over them, that understand that they are in good hands, Lord, not with all state, but with you, Lord, that you will take care of them, Lord. For those that's in the hospitals right now and in the nursing facilities and those that's on their sick beds at home that's battling some kind of sickness, Lord, you say that, Lord, I will revive them. Revive them right now, Lord. Let them know, Lord, it was nobody but you, Lord, and that you will see them through, Lord. That any division, Lord, anything that's not of unity in this church right now, Lord, we're asking and we're praying right now, Lord, that you let us be the good figs, Lord, and yet you help us and you restore us into what you have for us to be, Lord. That you let us be the pillar of this community that we once were, Lord. That we won't turn our backs on you, Lord. That we will constantly remain with you and you with us, Lord. That we'll keep our hand in your hands, Lord. Because you know what's best for us, Lord. You know what we need, Lord. And you will provide it, Lord. We love you right now, Lord. We praise you right now, Lord. Ah, we'll give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise, Lord. It is in Jesus' name. The one who hung, bled, and died is in Jesus' name. The name above all names is in Jesus' name. That right now, Lord, I, I guarantee you that if we find the graves of Gandhi, and we excavate that grave, we'll still find a body there. If we go to the grave of Muhammad and we dig up the grave, we will still find Muhammad remains there. But we go to that rock on the side of that hill and we roll a stone back, Lord. <laughs> we won't find you there, Lord, because early that Sunday morning, you got up with all power in your hands, Lord. And that same power that got you up from the grave is that same power that resides within us, Lord. So, Lord, we just asking that you teach us how to tap into it. You teach us how to use it to edify this body, Lord, and glorify your name. So, Lord, as we close this prayer and we seal it, Lord, we say it's in Jesus' name. Jesus' name that we will restore. It's in Jesus' name that we'll be revived. It's in Jesus' name we'll be repaired. It's in Jesus' name that we remain with you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we have our reward, Lord. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. And as we leave this place, but never from your presence, as we leave this place and never from your grace, Lord, we ask in, Lord, that you still be with us, Lord. That as we walk through the difficulties of life and we look down and we saw two sets of footprints, but now we see one, knowing that that's when you carried us, Lord. That's when you brought us through, Lord. Those that are traveling up here for this afternoon service, Lord, be with them on the road right now, Lord. Let them all get here safe and sound and return back home, Lord. Safe and sound as well, Lord, only like you can, Lord. Bless somebody in this building today, Lord and not let them give up on you, Lord, because you are a God that will see us through, Lord. It is in Jesus' name, the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. And the church say amen, 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 amen. and amen. God will see us through. No matter what we go through in this life, he will see us through the difficulty. Somebody is grieving right now, but the Lord will see you through. Somebody has some difficulties on their job, but the Lord will see you through. 
State Street, we got some issues and some problems, but the Lord will see us through. Just want you to know that God loves you and he is with you forever and ever. Test, there you go. Uh, as he leaves the pulpit today, he is pastor elect. But as he comes back tonight, or at this afternoon, he will be our pastor. All right. Thank you very much. You're dismissed. I need to see all deacons down here, please. All deacons in the house, come down here, please.